since it's that time of the year, you know, for Major League Baseball is well underway. And I want to begin with a story New York Yankees Hall of Famer Mickey Mantle once told on himself. And it was about a game in which he, he uh, struck out three times in a row. And he says, when he got back to the clubhouse, I just sat down on my stool and I held my head in my hands like I was going to start crying. And I heard somebody come up to me, and, and it was little Timmy Barra, Yogi's boy. And he was standing right there next to me, and he tapped me on the knee, nice and soft. And I figured, you know, he was going to say something nice to me, like, well, you know, you keep hanging in there, it'll get better, something like that. But all he did was look at me, and then he said in his little kid voice, you stink. <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes. It's not really the kind of encouragement you hope for at a moment like that, is it? You stink. Well, I want you to keep that story in mind as we look at our lesson today from John's Gospel, the 21st chapter. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there. Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. <clears throat> Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellas, Caught any fish? No, they replied. And then he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water, and headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about a hundred yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish you've caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now, come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you bow with me for prayer? God, we thank you and praise you for your holy and living word. We praise you, God, that it is a living word that speaks to our lives this day. Open our minds and our hearts and our spirits as you would speak to us. And Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, you know, the, the disciples are, are really feeling kind of demoralized. They're, they're ready to quit. And, you know, that might kind of surprise us because, after all, this isn't very long after Christ's resurrection. And you might think that they would just be exhilarated. But you think about all that the disciples had been through over the past couple of weeks. 
from the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, then to his betrayal by Judas, one of their own trusted friends, and then their own near arrests, their abandonment of Christ, and, and after his capture and Peter's denial, as well as the tormenting sight of the crucifixion. And then just when their morale is at its lowest, there were the events of that first Easter, the resurrection and the subsequent appearances of the risen Lord, including that Easter Sunday night when he appeared to them behind locked doors. Their heads had to be kind of reeling from all of it. These were events that human beings had, had never before experienced. But even worse, these events had completely exposed their weakness. Peter with his denials, and, and Thomas with his doubts, and the others with their fear and abandonment. Even if Christ is alive, how could he ever count on them again? They'd failed him just when he needed them the most. That was it. That's why their, their heads were hanging. It wasn't that they doubted Christ or his resurrection. It was that they doubted themselves and what this would mean for their futures. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever let someone down? Have you ever dreaded seeing them afterward? Not because they've done you wrong, but because you failed them. At a time like that, it might be easier might seem easier to just kind of let go of the relationship than to bear the shame of, of seeing them again. And so the disciples, seven of them at least, Peter and Thomas, Nathaniel, James, John, and two other unnamed disciples, decide to take a time out, time out at the Sea of Galilee. After Christ's resurrection, an angel of the Lord had promised the disciples that, that Jesus would meet them in Galilee. Galilee was their home. It was where, you know, that's kind of where we often retreat to, isn't it? When we're uncertain, we go back home to the familiar, to the predictable. So there they were then, back where it all began, by the sea. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter told the other six, and they just said, all right, we'll come with you. It's kind of significant, you know. Peter seemingly had failed in the work that Christ had called him to do, to be a fisher of men. Now it made sense for him to go back to what he knew best, and that was fishing for fish. He was good at that. This being fisher, a fisher of people business seemed really too difficult for him, and besides, he didn't even know if he was still worthy of that call. I'm going back to what's safe. I'm going back to what I know, is what Peter's saying. I don't know about you, but, but I understand Peter's thoughts and actions. I understand that sometimes when you're unsure, the default reaction is to go what, back to what you already know, rather than simply trusting God. Apparently, the other th others were thinking the same thing, because as soon as Peter said, I'm going fishing, they were right there chiming in, all right, we'll go. Not one dissenting voice remained. I mean, Thomas, just a short time before, had fallen at the feet of Jesus and declared, my Lord and my God. But here they are, and they went fishing. And of course, we know, they, that night they caught absolutely nothing. These expert fishermen went all night without a catch. But then morning came, and Jesus showed up, just like he had behind closed doors on the night of his resurrection. But they didn't recognize him. I mean, maybe it was too far away. The light wasn't just right. They couldn't see, make him out there. You know, sometimes we, too, fail to see Jesus right there in the midst of our failures. He's right there when, when our nets come up empty. And it might be that we're so caught up in the failure that it keeps us from seeing him. It might be that we're too distracted by the cares of our own hearts and lives. And, 
You know, that's why Christ says to us, cast your cares upon me. I care for you. You know, as I think about the the disciples' situation, I wonder, could it be that failure is a necessary part of a believer's spiritual growth? You know, I think one of the myths that's nurtured by immature believers is that following Christ means that you just see you see your life going from one victory to the next victory. And that failure means that God's not blessing your life. <laughs> what an absurd notion. I mean, you ask anybody who's ever accomplished anything where they learned their greatest lessons. From their victories? Of course not. To a person, they will say that It's from their defeats. There was an article in Fast Company magazine several years ago titled The Thrill of Defeat. And the article was about the Pfizer Pharmaceutical Company, which spends $8 billion a year researching and developing new drugs. The most amazing statistic about this company, according to this article, is that 96% of its efforts in the laboratory and in failure. Most researchers never work on a winning drug their entire career. Nancy Hudson, for example, spent 15 years in the Pfizer lab working on 35 drugs, and not one of them made it to the shelf of a pharmacy. Hudson became the director of the laboratory at Pfizer. She oversees all the efforts of the lab researchers in the research and development. She said, you know, we have to help researchers understand that only a tiny minority of them over their entire careers will ever touch a winning drug. We need our employees to realize that being faithful and focused on our projects is in the midst of seemingly insurmountable failure is as important as almost everything that we do. Did you catch those words about being faithful and focused. Does it work for Pfizer? Well, (laughs) something does. Those thousands of failures have led to some pretty spectacular successes. Pfizer is now the largest pharmaceutical company in the world, I believe. So, you taught a Sunday school class and it didn't go like you hoped it would. You invited a few friends to church and none of them showed up. You prayed and prayed for a miracle in your life, and so far, you can't tell anything has happened. And Satan may be there tapping you on your leg, telling you, you stink. But Christ is not. Can you feel Christ putting his hand on your shoulder and telling you to stay focused, don't give up? Life is not about going from victory to victory. Life is about learning and growing as the Holy Spirit works in your life. Failure is simply a part of the process. And it's not to say that failure doesn't hurt. It does, of course. And the greater the crown you're seeking, the more it hurts when you fall. You know, we read that Simon Peter wept bitterly after the cock crowed, and he remembered Christ's words that he would deny nigh him three times. Failure always hurts. But let me ask you, do you think that Simon Peter would have been, could have been as effective in his preaching? Remember, he, he became a powerful preacher on the day of Pentecost. But do you think that that could have happened if he hadn't experienced the grace of Christ after he denied him? He wept when it happened, but he didn't stay frozen in shame, and neither should we. I don't care what kind of failure you've experienced in your own life, whether it's a business failure or or the failure of a marriage or, or even a moral failure. Christ wants to help you redeem that failure, to help you to learn from that failure, and to use that failure to grow into the kind of man or woman that he created you to be. You know, I know as a parent, we really hate to see our children fail. But if we're always there to make sure that they never fail, they're never going to rise above it. They're never going to learn the lesson. Sometimes allowing our kids to fail 
It's the greatest gift that we can give them. You and I will have failures, but we're not a failure as long as we don't give up. The question isn't whether or not we're going to have failures. Sooner or later, everybody does. The only question is how we will handle those failures, with, with fatalism or with faith. But most important for us to remember is that failures where we learn that God is with us, that God hasn't given up on us. If you never try anything important in this world, you'll never learn that there's someone close by willing to catch you when you fall. A circus performer described his experience of learning to work on the trapeze as a trapeze artist. And he claimed that once you knew that the net below would catch you, you stopped worrying about falling. You actually learned to fall successfully. And that means what, it, what happens is that you can start to concentrate on catching the trapeze swinging toward you and not on falling because repeated falls in the past have convinced you that the net is strong and it's reliable when you fall. The result of falling and being caught by the net allows for confidence and daring on the trapeze. You fall less and you risk more. That's one of the crucial benefits of a life in faith. The more faith you have, the less you worry about failing. And how do you get that kind of faith? By, well, by trying and sometimes failing but always finding God's arms holding you up. Through failure and struggle, you discover that God's grace is sufficient for you. You know, Simon Peter discovered this through a failed fishing excursion with his friends. And we remember how the story ends. The risen Christ and, and his disciples are, are seated around a fire, a fire much like the one that Peter had warmed his hands on that night when he denied his Lord three times. And Jesus turns to Peter and calls him by name, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter answers, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And a third time, once for each denial, Jesus asks Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter's hurt because Jesus asked him the third time. And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. What Jesus is saying is, Peter, I know that you're feeling pretty unworthy. I know you feel that because you denied me three times, you're not qualified for the ministry which I call you to, but I am calling you out and I'm commissioning you these three times so that you know that I still want you. I still need you to feed my sheep. I've applied my grace to your life and I've forgiven you of your past. I love you, Peter, and I need you just as I did before to fish for people. And that's Christ's message for you and for me today, regardless of how many times we failed in our lives. Christ still loves us and needs us to be instruments of his grace and love. The world may continue to tell us, you stink. But God is saying to us, do you love me? Thank God for the loving net of his love that catches us every time we fall. Do you love him? If the answer is yes, then we've got some work to do. Amen.